You know, today it seems popular among startup churches to advertise that they're relevant. I guess that means they have relevant sermons. But for me, as an old man of 75 now, I think the most relevant thing is what comes next. And that's what Jesus is going to address in our Bible study today. Now, since the time that Jesus paraded into Jerusalem on that donkey and threw all those merchants out of the temple, the Sanhedrin has been sending delegations to try to trip him up in his words so that they could arrest him. It hasn't worked so far. So the Sanhedrin decided to send the Sadducees. Now the Sadducees were an aristocratic priestly group and they controlled the Sanhedrin. So I guess they must have thought if there's, if you want anything done, you gotta do it yourself, right? So they came to Jesus. The problem they have is that they don't believe in the resurrection. They believe that when people die, they stay dead. In a story today, Jesus corrects their error. The story is in Mark 12, 18 to 27. It says this, some Sadducees who say there's no resurrection came to him and questioned him. Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, leaves his wife behind and leaves no child, his brother should take the wife and produce offspring for his brother. There were seven brothers. The first took a wife and dying left no offspring. The second also took her and he died leaving no offspring. The third likewise. So the seven left no offspring. Last of all, the woman died too. In the resurrection, when they rise, whose wife will she be since the seven had married her? Jesus told them, Are you not deceived because you don't know the scriptures or the power of God? For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. Now, concerning the dead being raised, haven't you read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the burning bush, how God spoke to him, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are badly deceived. Now, I read that from the Holman Christian Standard Bible because of the way it translates that original Greek, which says you have been badly led astray. This translation says you have been badly deceived, kind of the same thing. They are deceived or led astray by their supposition that life after death continues much as it has in this life. You know, if you're going to use the process of logical reasoning, your conclusion is only as good as the premise with which you start. When reasoning from the premise that life after death is the same as life now, you are going to logically reach absurd conclusions, which they did. So the Sadducees confront Jesus with one of these contradictions. They must have used this old riddle on the Pharisees time after time, and the Pharisees had no answer, I guess. So they thought they would use it on Jesus, too. It reminds me of a smart-ass middle school kid when I was teaching. He said, if God is so powerful, can he make a rock that's too heavy for him to lift? Well, he had a complete and absurd misunderstanding of the omnipotence of God, and clearly I had some teaching to do. The Sadducees argument is based on Leviticus. It is called the Levirate marriage. I don't know if I pronounced that right, but there you go. It's a marriage that protects a woman whose husband has died. The idea is that the dead man's brothers should marry her 
and uh, continued the family name and provide a home for her and an inheritance. The Sadducees hypothetical example was obviously ludicrous, and, but, and their gotcha line, well, whose wife would she be when they come back to life? Now, before we look at Jesus' answer to this ridiculous conclusion, I think we need to address an error we see today in what I call folk religion. It's that people sometimes say that humans become angels. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, like angels. When you read the Bible, it's very important to pay attention to the small words. When Jesus quoted God, he used the present tense. He said, I am. He didn't say, I was. That's another small word. Resurrected humans don't marry or be given in marriage, but are like the angels. When Jesus rose from the grave, he was not resuscitated. He, was re he had a different kind of body. He was resurrected. Lazarus was resuscitated and had to die again, poor guy. Jesus was resurrected and lives forever. You see the difference? What Jesus is saying is that we will be a new kind of creation. There will be no more death, so, like angels, there's no need for reproduction. We will not be angels, we will be like angels in that we will not die again. In fact, Scripture says that we will be above the angels. The Sadducees were kind of making the opposite mistake. The Sadducees were kind of making the opposite mistake. They assumed that life after death would con continue much as life has on earth. They were assuming resuscitation, not resurrection. I don't think they understood resurrection at all. And that's why they were led astray. Which brings us to Jesus' answer. Jesus also uses logic based on their very own scriptures. They were assuming resuscitation, but that's not what Moses was talking about. Now, Mark has arranged Jesus' answer in a literary form called a chiasm, which arranges it sort of, sort of like drawing a circle around their error. Jesus starts in verse 24 by asking the rhetorical question, are you not badly deceived? And he ends his chia, this chiasm by saying, you are badly deceived. Jesus makes points in between. There, I think there's three of them perhaps. Jesus' first point cuts to the heart of their argument because he quotes from the only book of the Bi books of the Bible that the Sadducees accept, the books of Moses, the first five books of the Bible. He says, you haven't even read them. How about the story about the God appearing to Moses in the burning bush? Jesus has chosen a story that demonstrates that their crap theology has blinded them to what Moses wrote. They aren't paying attention to the small words. They don't know even what God's covenant with his people means. So, like my middle school student, they don't realize what the omnipotence of God means, and Jesus has to do some more teaching. Jesus quotes God, who identifies himself to these the three patriarchs, using the covenant. By the time of Moses, 
these patriarchs had been living with God for centuries by now. Jesus quotes God as saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Jesus did not use past tense. He used present tense when he reminded Moses about the covenant he'd made with the patriarchs. He ought to know he had just talked with Moses on Mount Hermon not long before. So the second point is the covenant that God gave. God doesn't give and give and keep promises to people who no longer exist, does he? No. That would render the covenant ludicrous and God a liar. Now notice that Jesus wasn't talking and describing the covenant which pertained to the nation of Israel. He was talking about the fact that the men who received the covenant were still alive at the time of Moses. Sorry, Sadducees, your joke didn't work on Jesus. He knows it's a ridiculous question. God is not powerless or ludicrous or a liar. God knows the power of God because he wields it. In fact, you could say that Jesus was the power behind the covenant. He will fulfill his promise. Jesus overcame death and maintains the people of God after they die. Jesus is reminding the Sadducees of the faithfulness of God and the power of God. That means we can trust God to do what he says he'll do. In this story, Jesus didn't base his rebuttal on the many passages of Scripture that he could have used, but he knew that the Sadducees wouldn't accept. Instead, he just used this story from the book that had Moses in it, the story of Moses. But I would like to review some of those passages that Jesus didn't use because I find them very encouraging for me and extremely relevant. The first, the big one, is translated a bit differently in the Jewish Bible, but our Bibles translate it this way, Job 19, 25 to 27. Job insists, I know that my Redeemer lives, and in the end he will stand on the earth. After my skin has been destroyed, in my body I'll see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I'll see him, and he won't be a stranger to me. How my heart longs for that day. And in Psalm 23, 6, David writes, I'm sure that your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Isaiah goes further. He uses symbol and metaphor, as prophets are wont to do. In Isaiah 25, 6 through 9, he writes, On Mount Zion, the Lord who rules over all will prepare a feast for all the nations. Their best and richest of foods and the finest aged wines will be served. On that mountain, the Lord will destroy the veil of sadness that covers all the nations. He will destroy the gloom that spread over everyone. He will swallow up death forever. The Lord and King will wipe away the tears from everyone's face. He will remove the shame of his people from the whole earth. The Lord has spoken. And who are his people? Apparently, it's everyone that he has created, which is everyone. At that time, they will say, he is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. He is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us be filled with joy because he saved us. 
Isaiah continues this theme in Isaiah 26, 19. He says, Israel, those among you who have died will live again. Their bodies will rise from the dead. You who lie in the grave, wake up and shout for joy. The dew of the morning gives life to the earth, so the earth will give up its dead people. The prophet Daniel was given so much information he couldn't understand it. We find that in Daniel 12, 2 to 13, where an angel tells him, huge numbers of people who lie dead in their graves will wake up. Some will rise to life that will never end. Others will rise to shame that will never end. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the sky, and those who lead many others to do what is right will be like the stars forever and ever. David says, I, Daniel says, I heard what he said, but I didn't understand it. So I asked my master, what will come of all this? The angel answered, oh, go your way, Daniel. The scroll is rolled up. It's sealed until the time of the end. Many people will be made pure in the fire. They will be made spotless, but sinful people will continue to be evil. Not one sinful person will understand this, but those who are wise will. And then later on, it says, Daniel, go your way to the end. Your body will rest in the grave. Then at the end of days, you will rise from the dead. You will receive what God has appointed for you. Which brings me to this important question. Do we, like the Sadducees, doubt God's power and God's faithfulness? Well, listen to this description of God from Numbers 23, 19. God's not a man that he should lie, nor the son of humankind that he should change his mind. He has said, will he not do it? He has spoken. Will he not fulfill it? So, in the end, Jesus answers to the Sadducees, describes the very character of God, who they say they believe in. God is faithful. God has spoken. God will bring you to life as he promised. It will be God's kind of life, eternal life. It's just logical. If you start with the premise that God is all powerful and has created everything that is, is it so hard to believe? And certainly it makes sense that God can make a new creation. He can bring new life to humans whom he has purchased with his own blood through Jesus Christ our Lord. He was called the firstborn from the dead. He's our brother. I'm an old man now, and I can say with Job, I myself will see him with my own eyes. I will see him, and it will, he will be no stranger to me. My heart longs for that day. I talk to Jesus pretty much every day, all day, on and off. He's not a stranger. But the Apostle Paul said it would be a lot better for me to be with the Lord, but I know that God has work for me still to do. And so I know that I will remain. And the same for me. <laughs> now see, wasn't that the most relevant Bible study ever? <laughs> well, it was for me anyway. I, I guess I should go ahead and tell you my, my dad's joke, a dad joke. He said you to remember the name sad, you see, is because they are sad, you see. 
because they don't believe that they will come back to life after they die. And God said it will be to their eternal shame. They're sad, you see. <laughs> well, okay. Bottom line, do we trust God's faithfulness? At this point, I would just love to read the first chapter of First Peter to you, but it would take forever, but too long for a video like this. So I'm going to encourage you to read the first chapter of First Peter. I'll put a link in the comments below. Thanks for listening. Amen.